Okay. Uh, so I can see a comment here on the chat. Let me start with that. Uh, Kiran, you you meant something. Um, don't mention the names of political leaders. Sorry, ma'am. I, I was just gave one example, one of like our... I got, I got your okay. point. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. No, no, that's okay. That's okay. It's, uh, that is it's, true, ma'am. Nowadays, it it happening. So that's the reason I just gave that uh, example. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I understood. I understood what you what you mean. So people have preferences of political parties and uh, yes. all that. Uh, but it's best to refrain from you know mentioning names of leaders and and all that mm, okay. because yes, yes. yeah, just pray for them. Uh, and we've seen today, no, that we are supposed to uh, follow the, yes. the laws of the land and all. So just be a good citizen. Basically, that's the point. Be a very good citizen. Beyond that, uh, God is there. God is in control. And even if we suffer anything, you know, unrighteously, persecution, um, yes. that is something that uh, Jesus said, right, that there will be persecution. So uh, for us to think that, yeah, persecution will never happen i think that mindset we can't carry because it's quite clear yes, that even if we do the right thing maybe we might go through persecution but that's a given yes understood. yeah you. sure sure kiran yeah but good i understood yeah what you're trying to say all right so yeah we've been talking about uh, husbands and wives right and, and the whole submission thing mm, so yeah, so I was in verse 5 here, where I uh, it says, For in this manner, in former times, the holy women who trusted in God also adorned themselves. So, you see, they adorned themselves. But with what? So, basically, he is saying that there is a certain adornment, or if you want to add the term beauty. There's a certain beauty, you know, that comes from walking in obedience to God and thereby walking in submission to, in this case, it is submission to the husband, being submissive to their own husbands. As Sarah obeyed Abraham, so he's talking about submission. Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord which means she also honored Abraham. So you see, there are two things here. One is uh, obedience, okay? And uh, the other is uh, with honor. So, you know, it's it's possible for us, like in the context of, let's say, workplace. I can be obedient to my uh, team leader. Yeah, I'll do it. But I can also, if I want, say evil things about my team leader, or I can... I can have a bad attitude towards my team leader. Uh, but I obeyed. So it's like obedience minus honor. But you see here in the family context, Peter is sort of reiterating and he's saying that have obedience and have honor both. Because you see that in the example of holy women of God. And the name he has mentioned here is that of Sarah and the way... Um, you know, as a couple or as husband and wife, their relationship was. So basically he says, you can learn from Sarah's example. And he says, whose daughters you are. Again, you notice, you know, if this is to a Gentile audience, then he says, you are daughters of Sarah, which means by faith, we are all now, you know, part of that uh, uh, lineage. So he wants the wives to uh, take from these instructions okay and he says you are whose daughters you are if you do good and are not afraid with any terror so how can a wife be submissive to the husband in this way because of her faith in god so uh, any questions beyond this i thought you all it's very practical no so you probably will have some questions or comments maybe so I'll pause for a moment and then continue. Okay, doesn't look like. So we'll move on. 
so you see talking about the role of husband and wife uh husband is in, wife is instructed now paul uh, peter is going to instruct the husband also okay so there is something for the husband to do as well so husbands likewise or he is saying similarly i have instructions for you dwell with them so first of all he says dwell with them so that shows you know the kind of a relationship that husband and wife need to maintain um dwell with them is live with them okay so then it is sort of understood it is it is uh, a given that husbands and wives generally will live together okay so maybe because of some travel or something here temporarily they have to uh, stay in different places that is understandable however generally it says husbands you have to be with your family you have to be with your wife so dwell with them and then he says with understanding so the way he pointed out submission for a woman to her husband he points out understanding for the husband so a husband is someone who needs to uh, you know walk or uh, understanding it it's it's a matter of maturity and wisdom so you understand you understand your spouse you understand the uh, family situation you understand you know uh, or you and you also try to understand so you no know, th this whole thing of communicating this whole thing of uh, you know trying to know uh, what kind of a person your spouse is and all so the the the, uh, the husband has to put in that kind of an effort as well so that's what he's saying he's saying husbands likewise dwell with them with understanding so what happens when a husband is in his own world he doesn't bother yeah whatever you know why should i understand that's when problems creep in okay there could be issues in the communication there can be so many challenges between husbands and wives but you know husbands are called to dwell with their wives with understanding and notice here back in those days itself you know where uh, we might wonder or oh, did they believe in equality of gender and all you do see that this was not trying to establish an hierarchy where one can rule over the other where peter is saying okay husband you know now you you are uh, you can rule over your wife and wife you are a slave you know, that's not what he's saying because very uh, soon he is instructing the husband now and what is he telling the husband husband you have to live with your wife uh, you have to try to understand her and then he is also saying giving honor okay so then it makes it very clear that this is not like you are my subordinate listen to me kind of a uh, situation at all because even the husband is expected to have honor for the wife okay so yes sarah called abraham lord but what is he saying in verse 7 peter he saying honor your wife so without respect without mutual respect we can say you know this relationship will not be what god wants it to be so from both sides there's got to be respect there's got to be an effort you know to uh, serve the other person and he also says that you need to the husband he says that the wife is a weaker vessel you need to know that she is a weaker vessel is she weaker in terms of uh, uh, her spirit her spiritual experience no because we know that spirit does not have any gender so when it comes to accepting christ salvation the blessings of the cross all that is the same whether we are a uh, male or female you know we see paul talking about that uh, but when he calls the gender you know the female gender weaker vessel or the wife is a weaker vessel he simply means physically you know in the matters of strength you might uh, even today if you do comparative studies like you know through science and all you would uh, notice that in terms of uh, you know physical strength uh, capacity men are um, stronger they may be even faster uh, right so basically the physical capacity is what is uh, compared here and he says that she's a weaker vessel so when it comes to expecting 
out of the wife oh you have to do this do this like he just says that you please try to also understand that physically her capabilities are not equal to yours so you treat her with honor whatever she is able to to that extent you know she could you could uh, get her to uh, uh, or, or other words uh, you understand that that would be her limit like don't stretch uh, beyond what she is able to do so that is what weaker vessel means it doesn't mean that uh, in the sight of god women are weaker than men in any way so that's not the uh, inference then he right there he says being heirs together of the grace of life so again you know he is only making it clear that uh, as far as spiritual walk is concerned women are not weaker than men or vice versa it's not a uh, issue of gender at all but he says if a husband is not going to treat his wife with honor and you know whatever we saw dwell with her understand her so if if he doesn't do that then even for a so called spiritual man you know who says okay i have a strong prayer life and i'm following god i'm walking with god basically he says in verse 7 that your prayers will be hindered okay so somehow god has put a clause there for a husband and said your spiritual life also will not be complete if you don't honor your wife because the prayers which you pray can be hindered Okay, and I think uh, uh, what God is trying to establish is He's trying to establish, uh, you know, that uh, harmonious relationship between husband and wife. You know, that both should both should uh, uh, give place to the other person. Okay, so. in that context you know uh, he he is also telling the husband that if you are not going to take this uh, relationship seriously and honor your wife then your prayers also will be hindered okay so that's about the family now moving on you know he is going to address the brotherhood brotherhood is uh, referring to the family of believers so he says be of one mind was it finally be of one mind what is one mind one mind is to uh have that uh, unity okay one mind is unity of thought does he mean that people should should not have their own opinions no that's not what he means you see in uh, uh, to the corinthians paul wrote and he said that we have the mind of christ first corinthians 2:16 so god's view god's thinking god's um you know god's god's standards that should be the standard of every believer that's his point he is not saying that personalities should be the same no but basically we we are all within the framework of god's standards so by even when it comes to our mindset regarding worship regarding church regarding you know um, the the truth about many things that exist in the world we think like god we should have the mind of god that's what he's saying so maintain that unity be of one mind so if all of us have the same standards you know honor um, speaking the truth in love uh, sincerely loving one another that's the way the christian walk should be so be of one mind or if you want to um, see the flip side of that is don't be divisive in the fellowship how will it be if we are always creating trouble for one another not good isn't it so that's what he's saying he's saying please avoid that division and maintain unity and then he also says compassion for one another what is compassion compassion is to um have that sympathy for other sympathy and you could also you know say empathy where you where you think of the other person as yourself or oh, they are going through a difficult time how can i be of use to them how can i help them so that is compassion so you see these are all character these are all characteristics that we need to have in a christian fellowship so unity caring compassion caring for one another love as brothers 
how do brothers love each other you know they they care they are also able to stand up for each other generally when you see brothers so in that way you know you love one another um be tender hearted be courteous you know these are all ways in which he is encouraging them to uh, be faithful to the fellowship let me quickly read these same verses in another version so that way uh, you will know better yeah that will be self explanatory verses 8 and 9 Uh, yeah so this is the message version uh, i'm reading from 8 to 12 okay so he's saying summing up be agreeable be sympathetic be loving be compassionate be humble that goes for all of you no exceptions no retaliation no sharp tongued sarcasm instead bless that's your job to bless you will be a blessing and also get a blessing that uh, goes on whoever wants to embrace life and see the day fill up with good here's what you do say nothing evil or hurtful snub evil and cultivate good run after peace for all your worth god looks on all who all this with approval listening and responding well to what he said but he turns his back on those who do evil things so i think it's quite self explanatory verses 8 through 9 in the fellowship he just says that you know, don't have a negative attitude uh, be positive and also he says bless on the contrary bless so we are here to bless one another and uh, he says that this is what god wants you to do okay and uh, keep your tongue from evil or your lips from speaking deceit and when we do all these things uh, we we are again in that same mode you know you are basically being submissive to god and uh, he's saying that uh, when we seek peace pursue it what happens you know god uh, his eyes are on the righteous people who do the right thing and uh, he is his ears are inclined towards us which means that god wants to hear our prayers and also answer them so god will respond to a believer who is walking in this manner now you know let's continue more uh, of what kind of attitude one needs to carry and uh, conduct behavior these are all matters that peter is addressing so from verse 13 he continues to say that one must one must be a good person okay or or do what is right do what is good and he points out and says that you know when we do what is good who will harm us so you get a good standing everywhere when you do the right thing because god is on your side why should you fear anybody okay maybe it's taking some time right now when you're going through all these painful experiences but we have the confidence that god is a just god and he will uh, bring justice for us he will bless us for the wrong things that we are going through so he's telling the believers do the right thing in every situation and now you know these people were also suffering right under persecution so when we come under persecution uh, even at that time you know we should have a resolve to do what is right before god and he he en- encourages them and he says listen even if you should suffer for righteousness sake you are blessed so don't feel bad if you're going through uh, all these sorrows for being right it's it's very tough isn't it because we uh, could have all these questions in our mind that god why am i going through when i'm doing the right thing you know but he says no don't don't feel that way just remember that you are blessed for doing the right thing you are suffering and uh, don't be afraid of any threats that people might uh, uh, give you or don't be troubled but 
always honor God in your hearts. And he says, be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you. So he says that uh, there will be persecution. But even in the midst of that, do the right thing and know deep within in our hearts that I am blessed because I am going through the suffering for the right that I am doing and continue to honor God in your heart. Never say, never think, you know, why, why is this God? Why did you do this to me? You know, sometimes we could tend towards um, blaming God, complaining against God. But he says, no, maintain a good attitude towards God. And he says, be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks. People may ask you when they are persecuting you. They might ask you, uh, what is there in this salvation? What did Jesus do for you? So we are, we should know this salvation which we have received. Unfortunately, sometimes we don't understand what Christ has done for us. So in that situation, we're not able to tell others, you know, or explain to others. But that shouldn't be the case. So when I fully understand or I understand deeply what Jesus has done for me, what salvation is all about. When someone questions me, an, uh, 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 an ignorant person or, you know, someone who maybe even they even want to accuse me, but I am able to explain and give a defense for the hope that I have in uh, God. And it says with meekness and fear. So we're also told about the attitude that we must carry you know many times uh, uh, i don't know if it has happened to you people but uh, excuse me it has happened to me you know sometimes when uh, uh, this is when i was a young believer people questioned and i was very excited to give the answers from the bible oh this passage says like this that passage says like that um, so people ask you Right? Oh, you're, you're saying I uh, go to church, I pray to Jesus. Okay, tell me. And, you know, they put questions. So I would answer all the questions. But you see here, the same passage, it says, you be ready to give a defense for what you, uh, for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. It simply means be humble, with a humble attitude. So now when I look back, Sometimes maybe I answered with uh, uh, a, a competitive spirit where I said, okay, wait, let me show you what the Bible says and how wrong you are. So that is not the attitude with which we have to answer people who question the faith, but meekness and fear, which means a humble attitude where we say, okay, you know, okay, this is what I know. I will share it. Maybe you will come to know the Lord through what I'm sharing and, you know, be blessed through uh, my life, my testimony, the things that I, I want to uh, place before you. So that's a meek attitude. That's an attitude which honors the people who are questioning us and also honors God. So having this kind of an attitude, he says, also have a good conscience when People defame you as evildoers, those who revile your good conduct in Christ. Uh, when we maintain a good attitude, what happens? When people are accusing, threatening, uh, being very rude to us, they also will be ashamed of themselves because they will understand more than the answers. You know, we are able to see a life transformation in this individual. And uh, this is not normal for someone to be so, uh, you know, so strong in their faith and be humble at the same time. So uh, even the persecutors will be ashamed of themselves. If Do you remember the greatest impact that hap that is talked of, you know, in Paul's life before he became a believer? Maybe Paul was around 28 at that time and called Saul. Um, he saw the stoning of Stephen. So the persecution of Stephen. But he was amazed 
when he saw the confidence that Stephen had, the way he gave a defense for his faith, you know, all that made such a big impact upon Saul, who later on, we see that God encountered him and he became a, a notable apostle and wrote so many, uh, you know, epistles. So the testimony of somebody who is going through, uh, 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 you know, a phase of persecution, how does, how does that person give a defense for the gospel? And what is the attitude they carry? Well, these are all very, very important things. Uh, and we can learn from it that when we have the right attitude and we also have the answers to the questions that people are asking, it can make an impact on them. And if they are uh, accusing us falsely, they will also be ashamed of what they are doing. Okay. And again, he reminds us, it is better uh, uh, and it is God, if it is the will of God to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. So in some situations, for example, uh, persecution where we have been right, but you know, uh, falsely we are being mistreated. Those scenarios, we do understand that you know, God will be there for us. It is a good thing that you know God... Uh, uh, God sees we have done the right thing and yet we are suffering unjustly. However, you know, it's not a good thing if we have done something evil and we are suffering for it. Now, when it comes to believers, you know, let's just take for example, believers. Okay. Uh, many, many incidents of persecution are reported uh, and we understand that uh, yeah people have gone against them unjustly and uh, believers are suffering but you see in some situations it is also possible that believers were unwise and they get into trouble okay for example you know we we when we talk about uh, kingdom building kingdom builders we we say that you know we have to we have a mission to share the gospel. But as much as we have the mission, how we go about the mission is also important. So let's say, for example, I, I don't uh, follow the laws of the land or um, if there's a certain timing you know, where I, I'm allowed to do my crusade or my open air meeting, it's better that I do it within that time. Sometimes what happens, we believers, we will uh, overshoot the time limits. And then when the police comes to question or the local authorities come and say, sir, why did you uh, keep the meeting till 11 p.m. when you're supposed to close it at 9 p.m.? And we say, no, no, I did it for God. Then, you know, they take us to task. And we, if we say that, oh, I'm being persecuted, that's not fair. Because here it says it is good to suffer if we have done what is right. You've done the good thing and you're suffering. That is understandable. Okay, You're going through persecution. But when we have done evil and we are suffering, we should not call that persecution. I gave you a very, very simple example, but you know it's it's helpful. Many of us are in the ministry, so think about it. When we plan our uh, outreaches or when we plan anything, if there are government rules, laws, be mindful of those things. Okay, or or for even don't even have to think about the laws and all just sensitivity right sensitivity to other believers sometimes we have prayer meetings in our homes and we end up being so loud or maybe we are uh, having it late into the night that our neighbors are disturbed uh, our uh, apartment complex is disturbed and then you know people may complain and say what is this it's too noisy or it's uh, not in the correct timings, it's late into the night. At that time, we should not say, I'm being persecuted because it's not correct. We are the ones who are being insensitive to people around us. So, I mean, think about all these things, even when we take a place, you know, for our church uh, hall. If uh, some of you as pastors, you're going to plan 
ha uh-huh, we are going to build a church so think of many things okay if i have a church hall in a residential area will it be a disturbance for the people how will the parking be what if the parking you know if they our believers go and park their bikes all over the place then we can't say when people come complaining we shouldn't say oh they are persecuting us we are worshiping god and they are persecuting no because we are the ones who are insensitive to the others okay so these are all small small things but they make a very big difference so in a in a residential area so if i am having a loud prayer going on every day you know how will it affect the neighbors okay maybe that's the only place that i got but how can i run the services in such a way that it will not be a nuisance for the locality or let's say um you know sound system speakers we put loud sound system and uh, our our um worship services you know sometimes it's little long no comparatively one hour more than one hour so for one hour the neighbors have to bear with the, the noise levels so you know all these things even as believers we saw that that if we do some if we are doing good and we are suffering for doing good god will come to our rescue but if we are simply being careless not being good citizens being insensitive to people around us and then we get into trouble then sorry that verse will not apply to us because we have not done what is right and now we are facing so called persecution but you know that was avoidable very much you know by us so just be mindful of all these things now if we have done the right thing and we are suffering so when you look at the book of acts there were a uh, times when you know the believers were beaten imprisoned for what for doing the right thing they just shared about jesus and you know they were uh, being ill treated so under those circumstances when you have done the right thing and you are being persecuted now peter is referring back to jesus and jesus is suffering and he wants us to meditate on that because we can gain so much of strength from the way jesus underwent persecution being righteous okay so he says jesus he suffered once for sins i'm on verse 18 the just for the unjust so you see that just meaning he was right and who did he suffer for the unjust all of mankind which is sinful so he suffered for them why did he do it no it's like the gospel uh summed up in in this line he says so that he can bring us to god so there is a mission he's accomplishing a mission through the sufferings that he underwent being put to death in the flesh but made alive by the spirit so right there the death of jesus is being spoken about and the resurrection of jesus by the holy spirit is being spoken about now a little bit is explained about what happened when jesus died so when jesus died we know that he went to hades to get the the keys okay of authority back uh, in verse 19 we are also told that he went and preached to the spirits in prison who formerly were disobedient so let's read further then only you will understand what it means so there are some spirits in the prison and jesus went and preached to them when he had died when once the divine long suffering waited in the days of noah so here we understand so in the days of noah there was the trespassing that took place if you go back to genesis 6 you know the uh, at that time the world was very sinful is what we read there were the men the sons of god who married the daughters of men so it's talking about angels okay so the sons of god uh, is a reference to angels who have sinned against god and that is why in the previous verse verse 19 
when Jesus goes, it says he preached to the prisoners. Who are these prisoners? And then, you know, it also describes them as being disobedient. Who are these people? They were the disobedient angels during Noah's time who have now been punished and they have been put in prisons. So when, what, when Jesus preached, what did he preach? You know, we could also understand this as, you know, what the redemptive work that Jesus has done, it was revealed to the angels. It was basically revealed to them. God's uh, wonderful plan through the death, burial, resurrection of the Son of God, which I think the angels did not understand. So they would have thought, why is Jesus going through all these things? But it was very clear once Jesus had died and he went and took the authority from Hades. So that is what is uh, being mentioned in this verse. So don't let this verse confuse you in any way. So, he continues and he says that uh, you you see that at the time of Noah, uh, eight people were saved out of the waters. And so he is referring to the waters of Noah uh, as being similar to the waters of baptism. So he says that there is also an antitype which now saves us. So there is baptism. Okay, which uh, he's talking about. But again, he clarifies and he says, not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God. So he says that through baptism, one cannot be saved. So when you go into the water, we don't expect that water to wash uh, the filth of our flesh because it does not have the capacity to do that. But how does the cleansing really happen through salvation. So one needs to believe in their heart the Lord Jesus and confess with their mouth. That is how they are saved. And when we study about baptism, we understand that baptism is an outward expression of an inward change. So baptism in itself is not what is going to clean us of our sin. Okay. Uh, so these are things that he is putting before the people. And um, yeah, he continues to talk about Jesus. So he says, Jesus, when he died, he went uh, uh, and preached in, in, uh, uh, to, the, to the prisoners. And then he rose again through resurrection of Jesus Christ. And then he says, now he's at the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers having been made subject to him so you know it is beautiful there is so much hope in this passage because earlier we saw he says when you go through persecution for the right thing don't be discouraged because look at the example of jesus he also underwent persecution when he was righteous but look at the end result what is the end result? He rose from the dead. He is ascended up into heaven. He's at the right hand of God. Not only that, the way Philippians says, everything has been put under him. So he has gained that authority. And all things, angels, authorities, powers, they have been made subject to him. So, we were earlier talking about submission, being subject to, you know, different authority structures on the earth. But you see through the obedient life of Christ to the Father and doing the right thing in the midst of persecution, what happened? Everything has been made subject to Jesus. So that is the kind of authority that Jesus has gained through his life, fulfilling of God's purpose. Now, chapter 4, you know, it's basically a continuation and an encouragement to keep looking at the Lord Jesus for what he has done and how he has faced persecution. Okay, so uh, coming now to 
chapter 4 uh, are you all okay are you all with me okay are you able to understand yes i can understand okay great thank you so much yeah let's uh, continue so coming now to chapter 4 so we have understood so he uh, talks about submission and then he brings jesus into the picture and he wants us to focus on jesus and see how jesus is now placed in authority and over there you know he says uh, angels authorities powers so all the hierarchy of heaven Okay. and even when he talks about you know powers and all we know that there are uh, demons okay those the things pertaining to the kingdom of darkness but everything has been put under him so what a victory god has given jesus who walked in such great submission to the father now coming to the uh, uh believers once again you know the encouragement carries on so chapter 4 verse 1 he says therefore since christ suffered for us in the flesh arm yourselves also with the same mind so when you go through suffering okay you uh, go by the example of our lord jesus christ so he says you have the same mind for he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin so when jesus suffered he overcame sin uh and on behalf of all of mankind but now he's also saying that when we go through the suffering uh of persecution and suffering in the flesh okay he refers to it as suffering in the flesh you know it's very very difficult when uh, we experience these things uh but the positive side of it is he says that one who goes through physical um you know difficulty for the sake of the gospel it is as if we have ceased from sin or you know there is a property of uh i am not able to put it the correct way you see when you face persecution and in those moments of persecution you realize oh wow you know um uh, god is what is most important uh and i don't have to fear people i will do the right thing yes i'm going through a lot of pain in my physical body in my uh, emotions but i have understood that the kingdom of god is worth it the gospel is worth it okay so what happens to people who have been through sufferings of that sort we could say that they have somehow risen above the mindset of the world where we recognize hey i have nothing to lose you know and uh, thereby there is a greater obedience to the things of god so that's his understanding in what he's saying he's saying for he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin now i don't know if you have read um the the uh, biographies of people who have gone through a lot of persecution there are i i have read some um the book of acts is a wonderful Uh, you know example for us but uh, also like richard wormbrand in god's underground you know there's a there's a book so there he describes the persecution that he went through uh, during the communist period and it's very scary to see all the extreme things that happened to him and i think in our lifetime you know many of us we we never even touch the a uh, thresho never even touched the surface of the kind of persecution that some people have experienced in their lifetime um but when you when you read about people who have been through things like this and they have had genuine faith in Christ and they have stood up for their faith you know in very very difficult circumstances you see that their perspective of life itself has changed uh they value the eternal things and the flesh 
you know or or the lusts of the flesh they don't have uh, that much of a hold on on such people who have you know gone through and come out victorious of uh, you know situations of persecution so that is what he is telling the believers and in a way it is an encouragement to say that see even the persecution that you're going through uh, you will cease from sin or in other words the the uh, attractions of the flesh will not be as strong anymore because you know you've kind of in a way seen it all also been through physical pain for the sake of the gospel so your perspective will also be uh, different so that's in a way an advantage you can say um, that you can receive even if you go through persecution now this is not to say that oh everybody go through persecution then only you will overcome the flesh no because we know that through the spirit through the word through already the work of salvation we have overcome the flesh so one does not have to go through persecution but if persecution happens you reap the benefits if you have the right attitude in the persecution okay uh, so we've understood that all right now moving forward uh he again uh, tells the believers that you are going through persecution but you know what your current life in christ is so valuable if you look back at your old life you know what was the purpose which you had or uh, what you know what was the eternal thing of value in that life because you ended up living he's telling the believers the gentiles <laughs> however you like so he lists down you know several things here i'll try try to read it from the message version okay so here uh, in the nkjv version he says for we have spent enough of our past lifetime in doing the will of the gentiles and then he lists out certain things so i'm reading that from the message version now for us so first peter chapter 4 verse 3 yeah he says you've already put in your time in that god ignorant way of life so the past life partying night after night a drunken and pro prof profligate life now it's time to be done with it for good of course your old friends don't understand why you don't join in with the old gang anymore but you don't have to give an account to them they are the ones who will be called on the carpet and before god himself so i think you know it kind of brings out the meaning basically what he's telling the believers is uh we all have a past isn't it outside of god but when we came into the lord our life changed because uh this life is unto god this life is unto holiness so we have to leave our past behind so he's making a clear distinction so the lifestyle of an unbeliever or as message version puts god ignorant person we we saw you know drunkenness uh, and and maybe the gentiles had that kind of a uh, uh, lifestyle where they had you know parties and here in nkjv it says lewdness lusts revelries drinking parties abominable idolatries so it lists out all these things evil practices as far as god is concerned so he says that that is what our life was like uh but now we've left it and we are following the kind of life that god wants for us but what happens people who observe us maybe our old friends they were our community at that time they may not understand us okay but he says don't worry about that because even if such people are the ones who are persecuting you you know today they are the ones who judge us but remember this one day we all have to stand before god and even they who are judging you they will be judged you know in the presence of god so continue to carry the li right lifestyle as a believer okay so let me just stop here hopefully in the next uh, session we can complete first peter 
and also start with second beta i don't know but you know we will be able to do that uh we can close with a word of prayer i just want to request anybody who's able to lead to please do that please pray uh prince would you be able to pray please Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, dear Heavenly Father. Thank you. This morning that you help us to um, learn the book of Peter, Lord. Uh, as you're going through this uh, book, uh, you are always with us, and I pray that your blessing and uh, each of with us, Lord. Thank you. I I, I pray that that so that we can uh, live our life holy and before you, Lord. So pray all the students and so fast to ma'am Lord. Thank you. I submit the rest of the day in your hand. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Prince. Thank you, everyone. Um, and God bless. Have a wonderful week. We will connect uh, next Monday. Bye for now. Thank you, Thank you, Kiran. Thank you. Bye.